Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the National Civil War Museum. I think you all know me. I'm Wayne Motts. It's my honor to be the Chief Executive Officer here at the museum. And we want to welcome you to the 11th of our 12th lectures in, uh, in history, lessons in history, I should say, lessons in history series. And we picked this, le uh, this particular lesson in history because this month, <coughs> next week, is going to be the 243rd anniversary of the United States Marine Corps. So I thought it would be interesting to have a lecture uh, on the United States Marines, and there's no better person to do that than our speaker here this afternoon. So let me tell you a little bit uh, about him. Colonel Doug Downs is his name. He's a licensed battlefield guide at the Gettysburg National Military Park. He also is retired after 28 years service in the United States Marine Corps. He was an F-18 pilot. And he is on the faculty of the United States Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. So Semper Fidelia is something you live every day, right? Uh, you have to do that uh, every single day. So without any further ado, I want to welcome uh, Doug aboard, and we're looking forward to a great lecture on the history of the Marines. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. So it's just before noon on the 17th of October when Charles Wells, he's the senior clerk for the Navy Department, comes rushing over to 8th and I, 8th Street and I Street in Washington, D.C., the Marine Barracks. Uh, he comes rushing over there, and who's on duty that day but First Lieutenant Israel Green. And he goes, how many Marines do you have available? And he goes, I got 12 NCOs and 90 Marines. He goes, very well, then I need to speak to the Commandant. So with that, Israel Green will take him up to go see Colonel John Harris. He's the Commandant of the Marine Corps. Now, he's only been in the position for 10 months. But he knows this is important because nobody ever comes over to see Colonel Harris at 8th and I. So uh, he comes to see him and he goes, hey, here's what I need you to do. I need you to put together as many able-bodied Marines as you can. I need them to be under suitable leadership. I need you to go ahead and make sure they have cap and ball, rifles, enough ammunition, rations, and oh yeah, by the way, bring a couple of howitzers, get them on a train, and get them up to Harper's Ferry. And so with that, uh, Harris will say, okay, man, this must be really important. So uh, he's going to go ahead and take a look, and what he realizes is his XO, the major, happens to be on a leave. So as he looks through his roster, he realizes the suitable leadership is? First Lieutenant Israel Green. That's the suitable leadership. And so he tasks him to go ahead and put together a team. Now, ultimately, they realize there's no other officers that are on duty or well enough to go ahead and travel to Harper's Ferry. So it's going to be Israel's Green. It's going to be an ordnance sergeant by the name of McDonough. They're going to find another ordnance so uh, sergeant named Mundell. And then what they're going to do is put together three sar or four sergeants, three corporals, two drummers, one fifer, and 74 privates. This is what they put on the train to send up to Harper's Ferry. Now, what they've heard is that there is an insurrection taking place up at Harper's Ferry. Let's see if this works. Okay, so Harper's Ferry, there we go. There's the Marines heading out to the railroad station up at Harper's Ferry, this guy named John Brown. Now, they don't know it's him yet, but they suspect that it might be, that he's taken hostages, he's taken over the federal arsenal. Now, when Green gets up to Frederick, this is the first time he starts to learn any details. Because since the time he was told this, first he was told there's 100 insurrectionists, by the time he gets to Fredericksburg, it's 200. And so he also realized, man, they've taken hostages. There are people dead. Uh, three African Americans already been killed. The mayor of the town has been killed. And oh, by the way, apparently one of the insurrectionists has been killed. Now, also a part of Green's orders are when you get up there, you need to report to the senior army officer there because he's in command. Now, at the same time that this is all happening over at the War Department, uh, the word has showed up that, hey, there's an insurrection taking place. So uh, Secretary of War Floyd happens to look out in his uh, uh, ante room there, and there's a lieutenant standing there. Uh, you guys may have heard of Lieutenant Jeb Stewart. Uh, Jeb Stewart is out there, and he goes, hey, I need you to go in town. I know that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Robert E. Lee is passing through Washington, D.C. on his way back to Texas after a court-martial up in New York City. So you need to go get him. So Lee comes rushing over, and now he's get told, here's the mission. You're in charge of this expedition. So Lee will go over to the train station with Jeb Stewart, and taking an express train from Washington, D.C., they're going to ride up in Sandy Hook, Maryland, in a record six hours. Now... As they have this discussion, this is the first time that Lieutenant Colonel Robert E. Lee starts to talk to Lieutenant Israel Green, and he starts to get an idea of what they actually are facing. Now, the last word Lee got right before he got on the train is, it's 500 insurrectionists. <laughs> now, uh, since then, Lee, uh, Green's been talking to the other folks, and what they figured out is, I don't think it's that many. Uh, but what Robert E. Lee says we're going to do is we're going to march into town. In fact, the way they march into town is they're going to actually march into town on the B&O Railroad Bridge. And what they find out is that right now the insurrectionists have been covered into this uh, 
firehouse here, and they're surrounded because already there's two militia groups there. The militia group from uh, Maryland uh, militia group has come down from uh, Frederick, and then Martinsburg has also sent their militia from Virginia. So they got it surrounded, and uh, finally what the Marines are going to do is they're going to show up, and they're also going to go ahead and push everybody back. Now, Robert E. Lee's first inclination here is, let's just storm it and be over with it. Now, the dilemma is there's hostages in there, so that's a problem. So he's going to wait until morning. Now, what Robert E. Lee does is he'll send a message back to the War Department and go, hey, look, I know you've sent for the regulars up at Fort Monroe. Uh, just hold them in at Fort McHenry in Baltimore. I don't think we're really going to need them. And then when the morning comes, Robert E. Lee will first go and approach the colonel responsible for the uh, militia from Frederick. Uh, in fact, what he's going to do is he's going to go up to uh, Colonel Edward Shriver and he say, hey, this isn't really a federal issue at all. This is a state issue. And since it's Maryland, would you guys like the honor of taking these insurrectionists? And Shriver doesn't blink an eye. He goes, these men have wives. I wouldn't expose them to that kind of risk. You get paid to do this kind of job. Robert E. Lee is taken aback and he walks over then to the commander of the Virginia militia. Uh, a guy named Edward Drayton, he's going to say, hey, uh, would you like the honor, since Maryland has turned it down, would you like the honor of taking these insurrectionists? And the colonel, without blinking an eye, looks over at the Marines and he goes, those mercenaries should get the job. <laughs> and so with that, Robert E. Lee finally now chagrined, will walk over to Israel Green and he'll say, Lieutenant Green, would you like the honor of getting those men out? And Israel Green gives a long sigh, steps forward with almost a grin on his face, <laughs> will take off his hat, bow as if to say, I thought you'd never ask. And what he'll do is he'll put together a group of Marines, he'll create two squads, a sergeant, a corporal, ten Marines on one side, a backup sergeant, corporal, and ten Marines on the other, and he's going to get two hefty Marines with sledgehammers to go at the door. Now, before he can go, Robert E. Lee gives him a couple of instructions. One, don't shoot when you get inside there. There's a bunch of hostages in there, so just the bayonet. And Green goes, okay, yeah, good point. And the other thing he says is, here's how this is going to go now. I'm going to send my representative up there, Jeb Stewart. Uh, at 7 o'clock in the morning, on the 18th of October, Jeb Stewart will walk up to the firehouse. He'll knock on the door. The door will open a scant four inches. And for the first time, <coughs> Jeb Stewart looks in, and he sees John Brown. And he says, hey, here's your surrender terms. John Brown's going to start negotiating. I think you should let me go. We should get an escort out of town. Uh, I should take some hostages with me. And then... One of the hostages in there happens to be Colonel Lewis Washington. This is the nephew of George Washington. And he's feeling a bit froggy at this point, so he goes, Hey, don't worry about us, just start shooting! And so with that, the other hostages all start to calm him down a little bit. And, uh, and, and John Brown's trying to negotiate. Finally, Jeff Stewart can't take it anymore, and he delivers the signal, which is he takes off his hat. And with that, Israel Green will rush forward with his two bulky Marines. They'll pound the door with a sledgehammer. It doesn't go down actually connected at the top to one of those sliding doors. And so what he does is he looks and he sees a stout ladder next to the floor, next to the ground. And so what he's going to do is order his backup squad to pick up the ladder and use it as a battering ram. They hit the door the first time and it cracks. They take a couple steps back. They hit it again and it breaks. Israel Green's the first one through with his sword. Now, if we read his account, he says, what I saw was it was very dark, uh, filled with gun smoke at the time. I could hear the groans of the wounded, um, but I wasn't exactly sure what was going on. The first person he runs into is... Lewis Washington, who goes, that's Potomatomy Brown, John Brown. And so with that, Israel Green will go over and smack John Brown on the back of his neck, uh, knock him unconscious. Uh, as John Brown goes down, Green's going to run him through, uh, except remember, he was the officer of the day, so he never had a chance to go back and get his regulation sword, so he has his light duty ceremonial sword. <laughs> and so when he goes to stab John Brown and hits him in the cartridge belt buckle, the sword will bend in two. <laughs> Green, frustrated, will look back and see his Marines have now bayoneted two of Brown's other guys to the ground before he gives the order to finally stop the action. At 10.30 in the morning, Lieutenant Colonel Lee would say, Mission accomplished. Every one of the insurrectionists have been killed, captured, or mortally wounded, to include who he thinks is mortally wounded John Brown. As Green steps back, what he will realize is that one of his Marines is laying outside the door of the firehouse. It's Lieutenant, uh, or sorry, Private Luke Quinn has been shot in the stomach. This is a mortal wound. Uh, certainly we know this from the Civil War. They do what they can to make him comfortable. He's taken and a Catholic priest is called for and he's given last rites. I would argue Lieutenant or Private Quinn is the first Marine to die in the American Civil War. So what I want to do is I want to talk about the Marine Corps during the war. And here's how this is going to go. Let's talk about what they look like when the war starts. Let's talk about what they think their missions are. Let's talk about what their missions really are. And then let's flesh that out and say, what kind of lessons should we have taken from what we learned in the Civil War?
Because here's the rub. I certainly see a lot of Marines sitting out here today. Uh, if you guys go back today and you go look on your shelves and you go look at your two big books on the United States Marine Corps, the history of the Marine Corps, Alan Millett, History of the United States Marine Corps, 793 pages, 10 pages are in the American Civil War. Mm -hmm. If you go look at the Moskin book, the Marine Corps story, 913 pages, eight of them are on the American Civil War. <laughs> Arguably, this is not our best day. Uh, but so let's figure out exactly why that is so. So at the beginning of the war, there are 1,882 Marines. There are 63 officers in the United States Marine Corps. That's where we are when they fired Fort Sumter on the 12th of April in 1861. Uh, the Commandant happened to be John Harris. John Harris, 71 years old. He's a veteran of the War of 1812. What we will find is that the Marine Corps senior leadership during the American Civil War is ossified. Not unlike the Army. But because the Army will grow significantly, they're able to go ahead and move people along. The Marine Corps does not have that advantage. Um, so he is going to be the Commandant during the war. Uh, when we think about uh, what our average Marine sits out there, there it's actually 8th and I. This picture is from 1864. So let's talk about what the average Marine's out there carrying. He's carrying what everybody else is carrying. He's carrying a model 1861 Springfield 58 caliber muzzle loading rifled musket. Uh, because the Army and the Navy are buying them, and just like today, we buy everything that they buy, uh, because it was less expensive. Uh, if you think about it, for the average officer is carrying, at that time, uh, we were talking early, all officers had given up the Mameluke sword at that point. It was the Model 1859 Army Officer Sword. In fact, both the officers and enlisted carried that sword during the Civil War. It wouldn't be until after the war, in 1875, when Marines officers would go back to the Mameluke sword, uh, that the enlisted Marines still kept using the Model 1859. They're still the oldest active weapons in the United States inventory to this day. Um, if you think about it, the average uh, officer would carry a, uh, uh, a 36 caliber Navy Colt. Uh, that was probably an average sidearm sitting out there. Some older Marines tended to prefer the 62 or the 52 caliber Sharps uh, breech-loaded carbine. And if you think about the idea of either climbing up in the rigging to go ahead and fire down or shooting through a uh, porthole in one of those guns, that seems like a, a pretty good choice to me, too. If you look at this, the Marine Corps is going to grow. Uh, when we say, you know, the Navy grows four times <coughs> during the Civil War, the Army uh, at the beginning of the Civil War in 1860 is 16,000 strong. Mm. They're going to grow to over a million. The Marine Corps is going to just almost double, not quite, 3,779 by the time we're done. So we hardly double. And look at these very stringent uh, uh, things. Able-bodied, sober, and intelligent men from 18 to 35 years old, as long as you're over 5 foot 4 and a half inches, you're acceptable. And if you look at that guy in the end, I think he's pushing it. But the, uh, <laughs> Now, you go, well, why do we have such a hard problem? Well, first of all, we aren't authorized a big end strength ad during the war, which is not. Uh, but other thing that really hampers Marine Corps and our ability to bring talent in is, uh, uh, think about it, at the height of the, the recruiting in 1863, uh, the Army, you could sign up for the Army, get a $100 bonus, and sign up for three years. I don't know, that sounds like an okay deal. If you want to join the Marine Corps, you've got to sign up for four years, and we'll give you a $2 bonus. <laughs> And so the Marine Corps is up against that all the way until 1864. And then what you start to see is, certainly as the list of casualties grows in the Eastern Theater, all of a sudden the Marine Corps looks pretty appealing. And so it's not until 1864, 1865 that the Marine Corps is actually able to fill out our authorized strength uh, for what Congress says we're allowed to have. Now, if you think about our missions beforehand, you all are familiar with it. It's policing, right? We're going to guard naval yards. We're going to be uh, police on ships. And in an era of, uh, of wooden ships and iron men, uh, captains needed to have a Marine force on board to make sure that his command was sacrosanct. Uh, in times of war, we fired from the rigging because even back then, every Marine was a rifleman. We had to be sharpshooters. We're going to clear the decks of the enemy uh, officers and cannoneers. Um, we're going to be a boarding party to seize other ships, and we're also going to be uh, where we're going to prevent boarders from coming on our ships. The dilemma is the character of war has started to change. And Navy guns have increased in size now with rifled guns able to shoot for thousands of yards. All of a sudden, Navy ships are standing off. All of a sudden, too, the Navy is converted to steam. Who's up in the rigging? So if you think about where we thought our mission is and what it is, has become, it's changing. Um, and so what we find is that, first of all, Marines get co-opted to go ahead and fire our Navy guns. Uh, and we let them. We let that mission change. And ultimately what happens as the Civil War is the United States Marine Corps embraces the United States Navy's missions, which are support the Army, establish a blockade, and protect United States commerce, which is to hunt down commerce raiders. 
Now, the first thing I'll tell you is the policing mission does not go away. Uh, in fact, the policing mission that sits out there uh, will be in effect all throughout. If you think about it, even during the secession crisis of 1861, uh, when, uh, remember, Maryland's a, a border state, Baltimore is slave-leaning, uh, we were worried about Washington, D.C. being isolated. So it will be, again, Marines in Washington, 8th and I, and the Naval Yard will be sent to guard uh, Washington, Fort Washington, just across the Potomac River from Arlington House. They'll also be sent up to Fort McHenry in, Wash in Baltimore. They will turn the cannons of Fort McHenry back on Washington, or back on Baltimore, because they're not sure how it's going to turn out. And the rest of the Marines get stationed up on Capitol Hill. And the reason they get stationed there is because the uh, uh, Winfield Scott says they're there in case of alarm, outrage, or mob violence. That's why they're there. Uh, so we see that Marines throughout the war also are prevalent in their guarding responsibility, policing responsibility. Men at the Brooklyn Navy Yard will put down the... Uh, Spinola uh, uh, Brigade riots in 1862. We're very familiar with the New York draft riots in 1863, right after the Battle of Gettysburg. Marines from the Brooklyn Navy Yard will help put down those riots too. Um, we see some of this other guard uh, responsibility or policing responsibility take place even in you know, route. Uh, in the middle of the war, 1862, when Mound City, right where the Ohio River joins the Mississippi River, becomes a naval uh, a naval stationing point for four rays down the Mississippi. The Marine Corps is required to send a company out there to go ahead and be their guards and detachments. Um, when Farragut takes Alexandria and Louisiana, before the Army can start the Red River Campaign, the Marines are sent into Alexandria to act as provost guards for that town to keep order uh, before the Army eventually leaves. Um, and then finally, if we think about 1864, when we have Jubal Early go up the Shenandoah, or down the Shenandoah Valley, and threaten Washington, D.C., we have Marines again at Washington uh, Naval Yard will go up there to go ahead and support the defense of Washington. So now let's talk about support to the Army. Um, now, go all the way to the beginning of the war. It's 12th of July, 1861. Uh, we have a new Secretary of War, Simon Cameron. He's going to talk to Gideon Wells, Secretary of the Army, and he's going to say, hey, we sure could use some help. He will, uh, Gideon Wells will send to Colonel uh, Harris to send four companies. Um, and now what I'll tell you is, you know, to go support General McDowell as he's going to go out and start the war. Um, if we talk about that McDowell has a green army, we should understand that. Probably the greenest troops in his army is the Marine Battalion that fights at First Bull Run. Um, except for their commander. Their commander is a guy named John Reynolds. He's 60 years old. Uh, he is in charge of this lash up as they go. He's got 35 uh, years of military experience. The second in command is a guy named Major Zealot. Um, we'll keep our eye on him because he's going to be there. I'm going to read a letter, and I'm, I hesitate to, to read anything to you today, but I just want you to capture the idea. This is a second tenant, um, Robert Hitchcock. He's the adjutant at 8th and I. Um, he's going to write on the 14th of July, 1861. I was met by Captain James Jones. He said, Mr. Hitch Mr. Hitchcock, Prepare to take the field on Monday morning. Hitchcock writes his parents that evening. So tomorrow morning we'll see me and five other lieutenants with 300 Marines on our way to Fairfax County Courthouse to take part in a bloody battle which is to take place as thought about Wednesday. This is unexpected to us, and the Marines are not fit to go in the field, for every man of them is as raw as you please. Not more than 100 of them have ever been, been here over three weeks. We have no camp equipment of any time, not even tents, and after all this we are expected to take the brunt of battle. We shall do as well as we can under the circumstances. And so, it's true. What's going to be is five lieutenants, 12 NCOs, and ultimately 324 privates is going to go ahead and join Colonel Porter's brigade as they go out to Washington, D.C. Now remember, this is July. Nobody's really practiced at this. Um, the Marines get brigaded. We're actually a very good brigade. I mean, if you look at the people that they ultimately get placed with, um, they get placed with the U.S. regulars. They get placed with the 27th New York and the 14th Brooklyn. Those are not bad units to be around. And also there's Griffin's regular battery. And the Marines' job is to support Griffin's battery. And there's a couple reasons. Porter says, first of all, the Marines were recruits, but through constant exertions of their officers, they've been brought to, at present, a fine military appearance without being able to render much active service. So they look good, but they can't actually do anything. Um, <laughs> And then one of the reasons he attaches them to the Griffin's battery is it lessens the likelihood that the Marines would see much, if any, fighting that day. Now, it's going to take twice as long to go ahead and get to the Bull Run battlefield that they expect, 
And what I remember is the Marines are actually going to cross up north and re in behind the left flank of the Confederates there. They're going to clear them off of Matthews Hill, and of course we know how most of the day ends, up here on Henry Hill, where we're going to have Thomas Jackson earn his nom de guerre as the Stonewall. Uh, that battle ends with Griffin's battery being placed up there to help clear, clean off that hill. The Marines are up there supporting them. What's going to happen is the 33rd Virginia is going to charge them. Of course, they're wearing blue uniforms at that point in the war. They're going to be allowed to come within 70 yards before anybody shoots, and they unleash a withering volley. The Marines break. They get reformed, and they come back. Another volley, they will break again. In fact, they'll break three times that day before they reform. Finally, the 33rd Virginia will charge, and they will clear off Henry Hill. The Battle of First Bull Run has been lost. Now, as Marines make their way back to Washington, D.C., word will get back to the Commandant. Uh, after having suffered 48 casualties, <coughs> including Second Lieutenant Hitchcock as the first Marine officer to be killed in the Civil War. Major Zellin, he gets wounded, along with 17 others, and 20 Marines are captured. Commandant Harris laments to Gideon Wells. This is the first instant where any portion of the Corps' members turns their back on the enemy. This will stain this whole generation and our entire understanding of the American Civil War, at least as far as Marines. It's always that quote because he's put on the Marines the first time they turn their back. Now, because it's just us in here, we know that's not true. Right? We know the Marines had actually been beaten once or twice before. Uh, if you think about it, you can go back to Penobscot Bay, back in the American Revolution. That one doesn't work out well for us. In the War of 1812, uh, Bladensburg does not work out well for us because Washington, D.C. gets burned after that lash up, too. So this is not the first time it happens, and yet he will stain this whole thing. Now, there's some things that we should take away from this. One, how did the Marines really do? Well, 14th Brooklyn reformed three times. So did the Marines. And the U.S. regulars suffer 13% casualties, which is the same percent casualties the United States Marines suffered during the first Battle of Bull Run. So if nothing else, the Marines can sacrifice like the regulars too. Now, the Marines will continue to go ahead and serve. In fact, they're going to end up serving uh, in the Brownwater Navy. And I'll come back to those guys here in a minute. But they're going to continue to serve uh, along with the... Uh, uh, in support of the Navy support of the Army mission. Now, before I get there, let's talk about Drury's Bluff. Now, go to 1862. We have John, uh, we have uh, George B. McClellan now pushing up the peninsula. Um, I'll introduce you to a 27, 25 year old named John Mackey. John Mackey is from uh, New York City. Uh, when Fort Sumter gets fired on, Abraham Lincoln calls up 75,000 volunteers to put down the rebellion. Mackey joins the Marine Corps. In fact, he just puts on the USS Savannah. He will be down in Norfolk. He'll help destroy it so the Confederates can't capture it. Uh, he will be part of the blockade efforts. He'll provide the naval gunfire that allows the capture of Port Royal. Um, he will uh, be off of the James River. Uh, and as McClellan goes up the peninsula, Mackey will be on the USS Galena. Now, the Galena is an ironclad, just like the USS Monitor. In fact, uh, because of a storm that scatters that little fleet, the Monitor meets the CSS Virginia at Roosevelt Roads. Uh, or at uh, the, the crossroads there at Norfolk, and what we ultimately have is the Galena shows up the next day. Uh, this is uh, the ship for which Mackey's on. What they're going to do is they're going to steam up the James River, and they're going to go ahead and try and get to Richmond. They're going to run into a place called Drury's Bluffs. This is a picture of Drury's Bluffs, about 100 foot above the river. Uh, there will be fortresses put there. Uh, this is the last big bend in the James River before you get to Richmond, eight miles to the north. Now, they know they're up there, and we're going to go ahead and push a flotilla that's going to travel up there. Now, the way this works is, for the 16 Confederate pieces up here at uh, Fort Darling, uh, they're going to have plunging fire against the Navy ship. In fact, uh, the USS Monitor, so successful, three shots will plunge into that thing, and it'll drift back down the river. Uh, in fact, the other ironclad that there, the 100-pound parrot that's in there, it will explode, and they will drift back down the river. If you read Mackey's account, he says it doesn't matter. The Galena was twice as close as any of those ships were anyway. Uh, during this fight, it's going to be hit by over 100 shots. In fact, four shells are going to penetrate the armor. One shell is going to actually get between the decks, blow up, and kill or wound almost 30 people. With that, Mackey, who's been spending most of his day as a rifleman, leaning outside the rifle porch, trying to clear off any observers off of those parapets to help make their shooting harder. What he's going to do is he's going to turn back and look at that empty deck and say to the rest of the Marines that are around him, come on boys, this is a chance for the Marines. And so they're going to take up working uh, a 30 pound parrot. In fact, his shooting was excellent. He's going to disable the 10-inch the Columbiad that had done most of the damage. 
And finally, what he writes is, after six hours, with decks awash with bodies, almost out of ammunition, the Galena will pull back. In fact, they'll go all the way back and they'll set anchor. And it won't be until the 12th of July of 1862 when Abraham Lincoln visits George B. McClellan. He'll see the Galena sitting out there. And he'll take Gideon Wells and he'll actually go and inspect the ship. And he's, he's awe-inspired by what he sees. In fact, his comment is, I can't understand how any of you escaped alive. Uh, in fact, uh, Captain John Rogers is going to go to introduce him to three of his young uh, men. And he'll say, these are the young heroes of the Fort Darling battle, sir. And Lincoln will speak to each of them and he'll shake their hands and thank them for his gallant conduct. And then he's going to turn to Gideon Wells and say, these three men need to be promoted and awarded the Medal of Honor. This is important for us for two reasons. One, it's the first and only time the President of the United States has ever recommended somebody for the Medal of Honor. Usually as a commanding officer, they recommend somebody for the Medal of Honor. The second thing is, when Mackey gets awarded the Medal of Honor, he's 27 years old. He's the very first Marine to ever have earned the Medal of Honor. Mackey will go on to serve a, a wonderful career thereafter. Uh, as far as the promotions go, the three other Navy sailors, they get promoted to officers. Mackey goes from corporal to ordnance sergeant. Welcome to the court. So, uh, <laughs> uh, he will continue to serve uh, through the rest of the war. In fact, uh, uh, he will end up down in Texas. He'll end up in New Orleans. He'll end up at Mobile Bay. He'll go back to Texas. In fact, after four and a half years' service, he will fight 16 battles over scores of minor engagement, and the only wartime injury he ever received is he runs into a chain hook while trying to put down a riot on the USS Seminole, also part of the Marine policing function, uh, during the war. Uh, he will go back to Philadelphia. He'll pass away at the age of 74. Again, our first uh, Marine Medal of Honor winner. So let's talk now about uh, other brown water operations. We don't think about this much, but one of the things we have is Marines will actually serve on the USS St. Louis. Uh, this is one of the first uh, Western tin clads, iron clads, that is produced out there by the Eads Company. Uh, and it's while they are serving on that ship that they are successful at both Forts Henry and Donaldson to open up the Tennessee and the Columbia River. Uh, this is another reason why that success means that they have to put guards at now Mound City, uh, because that now becomes a naval base for them to, to be there. Here's a shot of that action. But that's not the only act work that they see out there. Uh, Later on, David Dixon Porter is going to ask for a thousand Marines to come out to the Western Theater to work on the, uh, the Mississippi. We only have 2,779 at our height, so that never happens. Uh, but what we do have, at least along the Mississippi, is um, Marines operating with the uh, Gulf Blockade Squadron under Farragut, after they take New Orleans, will travel up the Mississippi, and they will be involved in the bombardment of Fort Hudson, uh, at Grand Gulf, uh, and at Vicksburg. So we see them impacting, trying to shape those future battlefields so that the Army might be successful on down the road. So brown water Navy operations. Now let's talk about the blockade for a minute. Most of you all are familiar with the picture up here on the upper left. Uh, Winfield Scott gives this idea of the Anaconda Plan to Abraham Lincoln. Right? He says, look, we don't want to invade the South. You'll end up with 15 disaffected provinces. You'll have to occupy for decades. They'll contribute nothing to our national coffers. In fact, what he calls is reconstruction. Right? His idea is, look, what we should do is blockade the South. We should send a force down the Mississippi River. And once isolated, they will recognize the error of the ways and come back within the nation. Now, he also puts in his little two-page information paper for the president. Uh, he says, the problem we run into is the patience of our patriotic and loyal Union friends. Uh, at the time, anybody know the size of the United States Navy when the war begins? Two. Forty-two ships. But readiness was very important back then, too, so ten of them could go to sea at any one point. Now, this drive down the Mississippi River, that's going to take 60,000 men. And I already told you the size of the United States Army is 16,000. Nobody has time for the United States Navy to build 442 ships, which will have in 1865 as the largest navy in the world. And nobody has time for us to raise 60,000 soldiers. That's why Abraham Lincoln sends his very green army across to fight the first battle of Bull Run. So, when we think about this 3,500 miles worth of coastline, and we start talking blockade, though, at first you go, that's a nearly insurmountable task. So what they have is a blockade board that sits in Washington, D.C., and they start to use some systems thinking to try and figure this out. Do we really got a blockade 3,500 miles worth of coastline? Not really. What we have to do is figure out what, what are the biggest ports, and moreover, what ports are connected by railroads. And once you get to that, you're down to 10. They'll take six of them by 1862. So that blockade effort, you can see kind of all the dots around the map. I tried to provide some essay there about what's going on. 
is an effort to try and say, how do we deal with this problem? How do we go ahead and put the squeeze on the Confederates? How do we go ahead and attack their economy at the same time that we are using our military instrument and national power to go ahead and win the war? Um, of course, we have numerous cases here where we're able to do that. Um, probably the best case is um, when Marines land at Fernandina Beach in Florida. They're going to take Fort Clinch. This is the first federal fort to be recaptured since taken in the beginning of the Civil War. Marines are liberators in that way. Likewise, after having run the batteries and subdued New Orleans, it's Marines that go into New Orleans amongst a very hostile crowd, I might add, and go to the, the U.S. Mint and raise the Stars and Stripes. There will be a captain that will take another 300 Marines, and it'll take them to City Hall, and they will raise the flag there, too. Uh, if we think about even Fort Sumter, here's a picture of Fort Sumter. So we know you just see those very nice pictures all from the beginning of the war. We pretty much pound that thing on a regular basis. And finally, what's going to be is Admiral DuPont will go, or uh, Dahlgren, will actually get a bad piece of intel. And he'll say, hey, we haven't taken Charleston yet. But the word is, that thing is pretty much rubble. There's nobody there. So what we're going to do is, at night, we're going to take 300 sailors and 100 Marines. We're going to use some tubs. We're going to draw them in close. And then we're going to cut them loose. We'll shell that place for a while. We'll let them row ashore and then take Fort Sumter. It'll be easy. One problem we don't have to deal with. So here's how it goes. The uh, naval gunnery starts off at night. Uh, it's dark, and so soon many of those ships get lost, uh, even the ones that are the boats. When they arrive at Fort Sumter, it is bad intel. There are Confederates there. Uh, so now they're fighting their way to get on. They stop the naval bombardment. Uh, the guys who are providing cover fire, uh, they stop, and it's basically a disaster. Uh, they'll lose a quarter of the men. In fact, 30 Marines are captured there. Uh, and of those 30, 21 of them will die in Anderson. So, part of our Block 80 mission. Um, I have up there also Mobile Bay. I like the story of Mobile Bay, and most of you guys know this. In 1864, uh, we're going to have you know, Admiral Farragut and damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. Of all the ships that he has in his flotilla, 13 of them have marine contingents on them. Uh, so this is very much part of our culture even to this day. Of those 13 contingents, 10 of them are led by NCOs. Their activity is so great during this fight. Not only clearing men off of here, but you can see the ram, CSS Tennessee, here. Many of the ships that engage with the Tennessee are those Marines, just like you saw that picture of Mackie reading out the porthole and taking shots, is to shoot into the gun portholes of the Tennessee to make sure that, one, they can't load those cannons or operate them. Out of those 13 contingents that fight on ships in Mobile Bay, eight Medal of Honor winners will come out of that battle that go to Marines fighting at Mobile Bay. Ultimately, this is successful. The second to last major port uh, to fall. And then finally, the last one we have to talk about is in 1865, we have Fort Fisher. Uh, Fort Fisher, anybody know? Does that work out well for us? No. no. Okay. So you got the spirit already. Uh, so David Dixon Porter is going to come to the east. The idea is Wilmington's the last great uh, fort in the Confederate uh, arsenal, the last great port. Uh, and what guards it is Fort Fisher. And so the idea is he wants 1,600 sailors supported by 400 Marines to land and take the fort in a seaman-like manner. Uh, and so what he's going to do is he's going to put together 59 ships. It's going to be the largest naval bombardment of the war. Uh, and when the sailors and Marines land, they are to distract while the army lands behind, and they're going to take Fort Fisher from the rear. That's the idea. However, the bombardment stops early. Uh, the Navy have no training for land warfare. They aren't armed for it. They're all armed with cutlasses and pistols. Um, what we're going to find is the Army landings will be late, and so this ends up being an utter disaster. Porter will blame the Marines. Now, the idea that he had used, you know, had no coordination, no unity of command, didn't coordinate his fires, no rehearsals, and had used troops that never practiced before, you could look at that, but then it would be his fault instead of the Marines. Nonetheless, uh, this is a disaster uh, for the United States Marine Corps. Um, and so I bring this up only to say that uh, the Marine Corps is, uh, you know, that's, every, that's one operation on the blockade for every year uh, that we fight the war. The Marine Corps is very much involved. There's Marines in over 100 ships out there on the blockade squadrons during this time. Uh, in fact, the Navy very much considered it to be part of their operations. And you can understand why. One of the reasons that the Navy really likes having the Marines are, um, we talked about the idea of support the Army. There's no joint doctrine in 1860. So whenever we have a combined operations that involves the Army and the Navy, the Navy tends to be the supporting element, which means they're usually given a smaller role. The idea that the Navy might have some uh, marinized infantry 
that they control their own army, this is very appealing to them. And it will be Navy admirals, Admiral DuPont, Admiral Dahlgren, Admiral Lee out in the west. These are the ones that are constantly asking back for Washington, D.C., give me a thousand Marines, that's what I want. The Marine, we will never get this together. Uh, they're the ones with a vision for uh, expeditionary amphibious operations. Uh, and, and ultimately, <coughs> we, we kind of missed that whole note. Uh, the other thing I found interesting while doing this was, uh, I was surprised at the number of operations where Marines go ashore. We're raid all over the place, of course, because we are small units. In fact, if you think about it, when you think about dispersed Marines all across, you know, we talked about our small numbers, but all the duties and responsibilities we have, we don't ever train at the battalion level or above. We're all company size and below. In fact, when the Marines went in the field, we fought as skirmishers. Not in close ranks, let's face it, we're all riflemen, uh, and this makes sense. Uh, and so this was very much part of it, but it also hindered our ability to go ahead and execute things when we started to go battalion, and we never go something the size of a regiment before the end of the war. But I was surprised at the number of raids that we have that capture salt works. Now we know in the larger, you know, when we talk, hey, 1864 out in Shenandoah, we should talk about Saltville, right? We fight two battles out there. Salt's important. Not only does it preserve food, uh, but it's a key ingredient for, uh, for um, uh, curing leather. Uh, so salt gets to be very important. In fact, if you read some sources, they say Florida's greatest contribution during the war is salt. Uh, the Marines conduct numerous raids to destroy salt works uh, throughout the war. In fact, I count no less than four of them, uh, and I just found that interesting. So that's two cents from the cheap seats. Okay. <laughs> so now let's talk about commerce protection. I find this one to be the most fascinating because now we get back to that idea of we are naval and we are global. Uh, when we think about commerce rating, of course, this is uh, Confederate uh, naval operations outfitted to go attack unarmed Union shipping to drive up insurance rates, to drive down, to create an economic burden upon the United States of America. And so one of the Navy's mission is to track them guys down. And they do. They hide and hound them all around the world. Uh, in fact, you, you, know, you guys are probably familiar with many of the stories already. Uh, you know, one of the first ones, if you think about it, you know, th there are when the USS uh, San Joaquino uh, is going to go ahead and take the, the British mail packet Trent, uh, and we take uh, James Mason and James Slidell, that's a Marine boarding party that arrests those guys. Uh, now, ultimately, the Mason and Slidell are the Confederate representatives to England and France, respectively. Um, Abraham Lincoln will finally have to tell his Secretary uh, of State, Seward, hey, one more at a time, let's return those guys. But nonetheless, you see Marines out there. Uh, of course, there's also the story of the, um, uh, the USS Wachusett uh, is going to track down the CSS Florida in a harbor in Brazil. Uh, and what it's going to do is it understands the laws of neutrality, which says you can't do anything because Brazil is neutral. And they go, yeah, that's not working for us. So they're going to go ahead and steam past the fortresses. Uh, Marines will shoot at the Brazilian forts as they do. They will sail right up to the CSS Florida. They will unload a couple of broadsides into it, send a boarding party over, hook up the CSS Florida, and drag it out to the harbor until it's in international waters. <laughs> so we never had an international law get in the way of progress. Uh, so that's one case. Uh, and then you go forward to, uh, you know, even in the middle of it. So I told you the story about Abraham Lincoln, one word at a time. Yeah, except for Japan, right, in the midst of this. Uh, we are back in the Meiji Restoration here. This is now we have shogunites in Japan. They're not happy with the Western exposure in Japan, and so they actually fire on a U.S. merchant ship over there. And it just so happens that the USS Wyoming is over in the area too. And they go, well, we can't let that stand. So they will drive over into the Straits uh, in between two of the Japanese islands, and they will shoot up some Japanese forts and some Japanese shipping along the way, just to make the point: don't tread on us. One word at a time only applies for England and France. So uh, the other side of this is most of you are familiar, and certainly we have a picture of the crew, and those are all Marines on the USS Kearsarge. Uh, the CSS Alabama, probably one of the greatest Confederate raiders, has tracked down uh, US shipping all across the world, been successful. And, and you could argue the Kearsarge has spent two years chasing them. Um, and finally, it captures them when they go into, well, it catches up with them when they go into port at Cherbourg to go ahead and get some. Uh, some repairs done to their ship, France. Uh, the commander of the Kearsarge recognizes the neutrality of France, and he's just going to wait outside the harbor. Uh, finally, Raphael Sims, the commander of the uh, CSS Alabama, recognizes this is going to happen. 
And so what he's going to do, uh, and fairly evenly matched as far as ships go, by the way, um, as he pulls out of harbor, you have this little interesting seven consecutive circles where they duel around each other, and ultimately the Kearsarge, with Marines on board, will sink the Alabama. Now, you also have this little interesting line it has out here, the Dearborn. That's a British sloop that will come by and pick up Raphael Sims out of the water, much to the chagrin of the crew of the USS Kearsarge, who expect her to capture Raphael Sims uh, after they captured the Alabama. Nonetheless, this is all part of protecting U.S. commerce efforts around the world. But think about where we are. If they spent two years chasing him down, we've talked Sherbert, France, Brazil, Japan, and we know ultimately the very last Confederate raider will actually be in Australia in November of 1865. So this is a global effort. Uh, and so we see Marines operating on a global naval scale in order to be successful. So now, let's talk Confederate Marines. There's not a lot out there, in part because almost 90% of their records get destroyed in Richmond after the war. So very little is known. Uh, what we do know is when they're established, they get established on the 16th of March, 1861. Uh, that's when they come into being. And it looks very much like the Marine Corps as we knew it, which makes sense because much of their officer corps is from the United States Marine Corps. So I told you, 63 officers before the start of the war, over 20 of them will leave and go to the South. The problem for the Marine Corps is this. Uh, three, I'll make sure I get this right. Yeah, three of 22nd lieutenants, 11 of 21st lieutenants, five of 13 captains, and one major all leave the United States Marine Corps. So remember, I told you our senior ranks were ossified. That really agile, smart, innovative, middle rank guys, half of them leave. This hurts, I would argue, this hurts the development of the Marine Corps to assume new missions throughout the war. Um, now, a couple of things to think about. These guys will go ahead and organize. They will uh, be authorized, uh, 944, ultimately 1,000. They'll never be close to this. Uh, they will be organized into five companies. They are organized just like the Marine Corps is, uh, except for a couple things. One, they don't use fights, they use drummers. <coughs> And the other thing is, they model their uniforms after the Royal Marines, not off of the United States Marines. That's one of the differences. Uh, one of my favorite pictures is this. That's Lieutenant Howell. He is a Confederate Marine. Raphael Sims, the crew of the CSS Alabama, of the campaign I just talked to you, the Cure Sergeant Alabama. When the uh, CSS Sumter goes into Gibraltar uh, to be repaired, uh, Sims will take the crew, and he will head off to go command the Alabama. Most of the Marines disperse while they're in Spain, except for his personal friend, Lieutenant Howe. Lieutenant Howe will be the commander of a deck gun on the CSS Alabama during the fight of the Kearsarge in Alabama. Now, um, if you think about it, they will suffer the same problems we do. Uh, they guard all the attachments, and you can figure this out where they are. Uh, they're at Drury, Drury Bluffs. Uh, they're at Charleston, they're at Hilton Head, they're at Savannah, they're at Mobile Bay, and they're at Pensacola. Um, now, if you think about it, probably the first action is they're also on the CSS Virginia when it fights the Monitor. Probably the first action. What's the last action? They fight at Sailor's Creek right before the surrender at Appomattox. But there are also Confederate Marines fighting with Admiral Raphael Sims, who are traveling with General Johnston in North Carolina, who will surrender after that. And then finally, I told you the CSS Shenandoah surrenders in November of 1865. There are Confederate Marines on that, too. So that would be the last Confederate Marines to surrender. Now, it's a myth to say that Drury Bluffs was the only fight where Marines fought Marines. That's not true. Uh, I can count at least five engagements, not only in Drury Bluffs, but Pensacola at the beginning of the war. There are Confederate Marines over on the Pensacola side as United States Marines are at Fort Pickens. Uh, we know that they're going to fight at the... Uh, opening of the Mississippi River, and certainly at um, New Orleans. We know that Marine, Confederate Marines will fight U.S. Marines down at Port Royal, and then certainly uh, we talk about the idea of uh, them facing one another um, at Drury Bluffs. So how does the Marine Corps end the war? Well, the Marine Corps ends the war in not a whole lot better shape than it started. Uh, so far we added almost 2,000 people, and that's it. I told you uh, ultimately what we have, uh, we've increased our staff by 40%. Um, we added one officer. That's what we added. Uh, and otherwise, all of it was combat power, strength to fill out all those debts and detachments to draw all out. Casualties 102 killed, uh, 175 wounded. 
276 taken prisoner. Resourcing, we go from just over $600,000 a year to $1.3 million. So we broke the numbers. Um, ultimately, we know about how the Army musters out when the war is over. To great fanfare, the victory parades in Washington, D.C. The Marine Corps does not muster out that way. Guys kind of go back to their home stations and fade away. Um, ultimately, if you're looking at the record, uh, seven engagements for which Marines were involved in received the gratitude of Congress. Uh, Seventeen Marines will be earned the Medal of Honor during the, the American Civil War. Eight of them at Mobile, six of them at Fort Fisher. Uh, Harris dies, Commandant, in 1864. Gideon Wells is very worried about this because he's not sure who he could pick. Uh, he doesn't really want to pick some of these other guys. In fact, the next senior guy is under uh, investigation for a misdemeanor. Uh, so what he finds is this Major, Major Zellin, and he's going to make him the next time. This is 1864. Uh, Zellin has not a whole lot more imagination than Harris had, except he does do a couple interesting things for us. One, instead of the symbol on our caps being a bugle with an M in it, he's the guy who comes up with, we're going to use the Eagle Globe and Anchor. The Eagle for the United States, the Globe for our global responsibility, and the Anchor for our naval service. It's his idea. He's also the first general officer to hold the rank uh, and be the Commandant of the Marine Corps. Um, Ultimately, he's an interesting guy. Uh, the other thing I find in him is, in 1872, as Commandant, he writes to one of his majors and he says, a few good men are preferable to a number of recruits of inferior quality. He comes up with the whole notion of a few good men. And we use that through recruiting, even to this day. So, that's where he comes. Ultimately, one of the reasons he's successful is, he's very good with the Navy admirals. Because ultimately, the Corps after the Civil War is in very precarious position to be abolished. Let's face it, Marines working Navy guns, sailors can work Navy guns. As much as the Navy captains may like them, many ships go to sea without Marines on them. As far as amphibious operations, gripes, we know the 9th Corps for the United States Army has a crossed anchor and cannon, because they do amphibious operations. The Marine Corps, what do you guys contribute? Fortunately, is Admiral Farragut, who says, I've always deemed Marine Guard one of the great essentials of a man of war. DuPont says, a ship without Marines is no ship of war at all. And those guys are the ones who saved the Marine Corps. So, what lessons do we take away when all this is done? And there's a Marine guarding one of the conspirators that's uh, Lewis Powell, Powell, who stabbed Secretary of State. Okay, so moving forward, what do we take out of this? So ultimately, you know, I went back through and I looked at our history. And, it, and if you look at it, it's actually sad. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kyle Metcalf, uh, United States Marine Corps Historical Succession, session in the 1930s wrote, the Civil War period of the Corps history was probably the lowest ebb of fighting efficiency that the organization ever, ever reached in a time of war. Naval historian D Rear Admiral Hayes, after a century after the war, said the Corps can claim virtually no history of its own in the Civil War. What history it has in that conflict is merely a part of the achievement of the Navy. <laughs> I told you, though, even when we write our own history, we don't write much from the American Civil War. So what I would say is, why has that happened? I would offer it for a couple of reasons. One, leadership without a vision. We had a very old leadership was com comfortable with what we had always done. The idea that we might expand, that we might grow, that we might embrace things like amphibious operations. Now, nah, we're good. We'll just be guards, and, and we'll guard Navy ships, and uh, we'll fire from the rigging. Uh, scope. The idea that this war expands the way it does. Nobody has an idea how to manage all this, uh, and especially with a very small Marine Corps. So how do we use the uh, administration to manage that? Uh, we don't. Uh, in fact, even if you talk about squabbling between we were talking earlier, you know, imagine all these debts all over the place trying to run the war, and there's times when uh, Colonel Harris is having to answer other mail from senior officers of the Marine Corps saying that we should change the color of the tassel on our cover. Um, this is where we are. We're incredibly petty and we're not very visionary during this time. And this hurts us. Uh, and uh, finally, one company officer who served in Fort Fisher later commented that the war was our greatest opportunity and we owlishly neglected it. So what do I think we take away from it? I think because we study our history, we take a couple things. One, we are an expeditionary force in readiness. Yes, we are. When Harper's Ferry happens and who do they need to find that's ready? There's the Marines at the Washington Naval Yard. When there's somebody that has to defend the Capitol, who's there? There's the Marine of the Washington Naval Yard. When they need people to go ahead and fill a job because it has to be done, they come to the Marines. So it's no surprise that the USS Harper's Ferry sits out there delivering Marines anywhere on Earth, and right now, they're out there at this moment. 
The other thing, force and readiness. So in 1952, that's when the uh, Congress declares the United States Marine Corps to be force and readiness, be the force the most ready when the nation is the least. And so to this day, we are. Because the idea of doing, we'll just have to do as well as we can, isn't good enough anymore. And so we take that. The idea that every Marine's a rifleman. In that case, you can see those female Marines, they're also riflemen. We are deadly when it comes to rifle. I'm an F-18 pilot, but I'm a rifleman by trade. Anything I can do from 50,000 feet flying the speed of sound, delivering 2,000 pound bombs on anybody, is an effort to take a rock out of our rifleman's pack. That is still part of our culture. The idea that we use NCOs, we talk about the 10 NCOs running those 13 debts and the eight medals of honor at, the, at Mobile Bay, we are a service for which our NCOs are still the utter backbone of our corps. We are. Our ratio of enlisted to officers is the highest of any service, and it's not close. We will power down that because we know good young NCOs will get things done. It was true back then, and it's true today. And the last thing we look at is we study our history. So there is Major Reynolds. He commands uh, the Marines at first full run. We study our history because we know we need to be historically minded. It is not enough for us to go about this profession as we go ahead and, and, and not be about it 24-7. We need to be lifelong learners. We need to be studying all the time. We need to be visiting battlefields. We need to find mentors. We need to talk to veterans. We need to be about this profession all the time because we cannot be in the business of filling body bags with America's sons and daughters to learn this profession. We cannot. So we study our history to increase our patterns with the hope that someday we might be able to make better decisions so that we can do a little better than as best we can. So again, that is my takeaways for the American Civil War. If there are any questions, I'll bring William back up here.